In my last two videos, we talked about a condition called autoimmune atrophic gastritis. This autoimmune condition can cause low stomach acid and that can manifest as symptoms of indigestion, bloating, post-meal fullness, like, oh, I ate four bites, but I feel like I ate at a buffet. That feeling of a brick of lead just sitting in your gullet and not moving, delayed stomach emptying, and even deficiencies in B12 and iron that are oftentimes resistant to supplementation. And we talked about how this is very common amongst people with autoimmune disease, especially autoimmune thyroiditis like Hashimoto's, and how this is often a very underdiagnosed condition and a lot of people are walking around with this and they don't even realize it. In part two of this three-part series, we talked about the blood work that you can request from your doctor in order to start to rule in or rule out this diagnosis and why the second step of getting an endoscopy is important in the management of this, this condition. Now in part three of this three-part series, we're gonna talk about how you can treat or manage this condition at home in addition to whatever your doctors are telling you to do. Remember people, this is YouTube. I don't know you, you don't know me. Please don't, don't just take everything I'm, I'm saying and run with it. Like you still have to be smart about your healthcare and work with your doctors and like do what they say, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, legal spiel out of the way, let's talk about how you can manage this autoimmune condition. And before we even start, I'm gonna briefly draw your attention to a video that I did, and I hope you watch this next. But I did a video not that long ago about the idea of whether or not it's possible to cure an autoimmune disease as opposed to put it in remission. And I took the stance in that video that I think, yes, it is possible to cure an autoimmune disease. I just don't think that it happens very commonly because it's very difficult to do. So if you want a little bit more of an elaboration and a backstory on that, and you wanna learn how you could maybe potentially cure an autoimmune condition such as this, have at it. It was a fun video for me to make, and I think it makes a heck of a lot of sense. But before anything else, before we get into these, these management or treatment options that you have, the very first one that makes the tippity top of the list is actually treating and eradicating H. pylori if it is present. If you have H. pylori, that is going to make some of the diagnostic workup more difficult because gastrin is going to go up in cases of H. pylori, and antiparietal cell antibodies have been shown to be responsive to H. pylori eradication, meaning you could have a falsely elevated antiparietal cell antibody test if you have not treated H. pylori yet. And when they do the endoscopy and they look at the tissue biopsies when they're in the stomach, it could be a little bit hard to differentiate the types of gastritis from each other. It is possible that it just makes their job harder. So if you have not been worked up for H. pylori yet, or if you know that you have H. pylori and it's still in the process of being treated, this is actually gonna be your number one step because that's gonna give you more of an ability to really understand what your symptoms and your lab tests mean. And it gives you something more concrete to latch onto and something to track as time goes on. So H. pylori treatment actually becomes the number one, which is surprising because number two is usually my favorite go-to and that is nutrition. Specifically, I'm not talking about nutrition in the sense of like, oh, you need to cut out this or cut out that or, you know, lectins are the devil, nothing like that. I'm talking, are you eating enough nutrition for a human being to be healthy? Right? Like, are you getting enough riboflavin? Are you getting enough vitamin E? Are you getting folate? Are you getting, um, you know, a, pff, copper? I don't know. I'm running out of ideas. But the point is, I'm a big advocate of nutritional counseling, but not in the sense that most of my profession is. I'm not going to be the one typically to tell you to avoid FODMAPs or cut out a food or go on a restrictive diet. I'm usually the person telling you or encouraging you to eat enough calories get balanced macros, eat enough fiber so that you don't have dysbiosis for crying out loud, and get a variety of nutrients so that you're covering your nutritional bases and you're not running the, the chance of having multiple nutrient deficiencies, what's gonna do, gonna do God knows what to the rest of your body. So nutrition from like a nutrition 101, unsexy version of nutrition really takes the cake for number two. And it's very interesting when you get into this sort of nutrition, by the way, for autoimmune diseases, because you can start to really paint a picture of how every vitamin and every mineral is important. And you start getting into things like, oh, inflammatory cytokines, which are one of the hallmarks of autoimmune disease. 
inflammatory markers and inflammatory cytokines go down once you start getting adequate levels of niacin or vitamin B6, for example. Or, oh, we need to run our methylation enzymes in order to clear something like histamine or get rid of unwanted chemicals and toxins from our body. So things like your B12 and your folate levels become really important. So when you start researching it from that perspective of like why vitamins and minerals are important, you start to see maybe why autoimmune diseases are so common. A lot of people have multiple nutrient deficiencies or insufficiencies, and then we're walking around wondering why we have autoimmunity. So make sure that you are eating a healthy, balanced, nutrient replete diet. Maybe work with a nutritionist or a dietitian if you've never done that, and try to focus on the additions rather than the rather than the subtractions when you're able to do that. All right, number two, this is kind of in keeping with number two. We're going to march on to number three, and I'm just going to call this unsexy because I have talked about this so many times here on this channel and the IBS Freedom Podcast, but really taking the time to address the unsexy basics is going to be huge. And now what do I mean by that? Things like sleep, stress, moving your body, getting sunlight on your eyeballs occasionally, um, finding some joy in your life, examining the life that you're living and the relationships that you're chronically exposed to. Like, is your immune system being given a reason to chill out and not overreact to self tissue? Or is your immune system stuck in fight or flight mode just like you are? So cover the unsexy basics. Again, I've talked about them here on this channel quite a bit as well as the IBS Freedom Podcast, but I really think that those unsexy basics need to be covered before you get into what I'm gonna put as number five, which is the sexy stuff. So this is where we start getting into Candida, SIBO, leaky gut, Epstein-Barr virus, all of the boogeymen, all of the fancy schmancy like detoxification regimens, and I need a organic acids test, and I need a mycotoxin test, and I need to do a, a fancy specific detoxification regimen that my naturopath prescribed me, and I need to take 800 million supplements for it. I'm not saying that those sexy things won't have some role to play for some of you but it's going to be way down the totem pole. If you're jumping into fancy schmancy detoxes and fancy schmancy leaky gut healer upper protocols, but you're not getting enough fiber, good luck, man. It's not going to work. If you're doing, if you're jumping into some advanced Lyme disease treatment plan, when you have no reasonable reason to suspect you really have Lyme disease overdiagnosed, um, if you're jumping into something that sexy, but you're not getting sleep, Again, good luck to you. You've really got to cover the nutrition and the unsexy stuff before I would give you permission to jump into what I would deem the sexy stuff. But sexy sells, and this is the stuff that we see on Instagram and YouTube and Facebook and podcasts and TikTok and God knows where. Now, the last one, you'll notice that I jumped over number four. The last thing that I will say for this condition specifically is that you can target the autoimmunity and the mechanism itself. So I'll just put mechanism of action. And under that, I would say trying to increase stomach acidity directly with something like betaine HCL or apple cider vinegar or digestive bitters would be really useful. I, given the profound degree of low stomach acid or zero stomach acid in this patient population, People with this diagnosis, in my mind, really need to consider betaine HCL as opposed to the bitters and the vinegar, because I think that's going to be a lot stronger and a lot easier to dose and take over time. And this theoretically is going to be a lifelong thing. This is not a standard run of the mill IBS situation where you're like, oh, I take betaine HCL for six months and then I'm good and then I go off of it. No, man. If you have this autoimmune condition, you are compromising your ability to make stomach acid and you might need stomach acid support forever. You might just want to take out stock in whatever company makes the HCL that you're purchasing. Honest to God. The other thing is you can think about the nutrient deficiencies that are specific to this condition. And this, this would kind of go hand in hand with the nutrition because ideally you would be thinking about these nutrients anyway. But you could certainly think more specifically about iron and B12 and how those would play into it. And if you want to do maybe one more, 
and have a dotted line from the sexy category, you could think of things like SIBO, motility, and maybe even taking something like bile or digestive enzymes since those can be compromised in states of hypochlorhydria. You might even think of a leaky gut healing up kind of protocol, so something like L-glutamine, since the, the SIBO, the dysmotility, the nutrient deficiencies, all of that can certainly cause some leaky gut. So actually, let me add that one more. I'll just put LG for leaky gut. So there's a little bit of overlap between the five categories, but this is the general breakdown of what I would recommend to try to manage or potentially treat this condition, is you got to eradicate H. pylori if it is present. Um, you could do a H. pylori breath test. This could be diagnosed with an endoscopy. You can do blood work if you've never tried to treat H. pylori before. If you've tried to treat H. pylori, doing blood work is not gonna be useful as a follow-up test, but it can be useful as an initial test. Or you could do a stool antigen test. I'm not a huge fan of using the GI map for this. I know that that's really widely popular. I suspected for a really long time, even before the drama with the GI map company happened on this channel, I was suspicious for a long time that that test was overdiagnosing H. pylori. So if you're gonna do a more aggressive treatment protocol like antibiotics, for example, I would highly, 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 highly recommend that you use one of the other diagnoses, uh, diagnostic measurements that I rattled off. So breath test, stool, te stool antigen test from like LabCorp or Quest, or maybe a blood test or an endoscopy. I would recommend those before you jump into something like antibiotics. If you're gonna do a natural protocol for H. pylori, maybe you could debate the usefulness of the GI map. Um, but number one, you gotta treat the H. pylori because that's just gonna confuse you and make it so much harder to treat anything. Number two, nutrition, but from an unsexy viewpoint, are you, you know, if you went to college and went to a nutrition 101 lecture, what would they teach you about? They would teach you about calories, macros, fiber, vitamins, minerals, hydration. Go back to those basics with nutrition and you could easily track your intake with something like chronometer. As a side note, you want to do nutrition tracking without logging vitamin and mineral supplements. And you want to see what you're actually getting from the food that you eat instead of inflating your numbers with the addition of a multivitamin or a B complex. Because honestly, if you, there's no point in doing chronometer if you just log all your vitamins. You're going to see that you're getting 8,000% of your B12 and you're going to be like, <laughs> I am so great at this. I'm crushing it. But you could be eating Doritos for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and still have that if you're taking a B complex, right? So do the nutrition tracking and get a fair estimate of what you're intaking, but do it without logging the vitamin supplements, please. Then go on to the other unsexy basics like sleep, stress, movement, sunlight, relationships, um, you know, blood sugar, that sort of stuff. Then think about the mechanism that's at play with autoimmune atrophic gastritis, the low stomach acid, which can be supplemented around to some degree. Think about iron and B12 deficiencies in particular as it pertains to nutritional intake, and you might just need supplementation or even B12 shots in this patient population. And in the sexy category, I would start thinking more along the lines of SIBO, dysmotility, and maybe leaky gut. And that would be before I jump into other sexy topics like getting into, you know, Epstein-Barr virus and I don't know, celery juice and whatever else the internet is talking about these days. But this is a five point framework for how you can start to manage or maybe treat this condition. That is my phone ringing, so I'm gonna end it here. And now with that embarrassment out of the way, I'm gonna close this video by telling you that I cover pretty much all of this minus some of the really sexy topics in FODMAP Freedom in 90 Days. So if you haven't heard me talk about this yet, FODMAP Freedom in 90 Days is my group coaching program where I and a nutritionist hold your hand and walk you through all of this and a lot more. We cover nutrition. We teach you how to track your nutrient intake on chronometer. We help you assess what vitamin and mineral supplements you maybe would benefit from and which ones you can chuck. We talk a lot about the unsexy basics, especially in the first half of the program, because that's going to lay the foundation for the rest of your health, including but not limited to your gut health. We do talk about things like low stomach acid and how to supplement around that and how to test for that nutrient deficiencies, SIBO, motility, and leaky gut. And we cover other topics like candida overgrowth, histamine intolerance and mast cell disorders, the interplay of hormones as it pertains to your gut and your brain function, and even how to do an unsexy but still 
very useful detoxification program. You don't need to buy all of these detox powders and detox products and buy everything on your Instagram feed to do a detox. You can do it in a really reasonable, rational way. And that is what I teach in FODMAP Freedom. Honestly, the whole program really boils down to trying to be reasonable and rational and go, by, go bit by bit like a little citizen scientist. So if you want to learn about yourself and you want to really understand how to implement what I taught you in this video, I would love to start my new year with you in FODMAP Freedom if you would allow me to do so. We're gonna be enrolling again in mid-January. So if you are at all interested, it's right around the corner. I would encourage you to go to the link in the description down below and join the FODMAP Freedom waitlist. All that means is I'm gonna send you an email about once a week, letting you know when a new YouTube video like this has posted. And then on January, I believe it's 13th, I'm gonna email you first before anybody else. And I'm gonna let you know that the doors are open and you are welcome to book your discovery call and consider joining us in FODMAP Freedom. Effectively, that lets you skip the line, which is really important because we've had to actually close enrollment a couple of times because we reached our capacity. So you want to get in earlier in the process rather than waiting until the last minute. But also you get a super cool bonus gift if you join us during early enrollment week. And again, that early enrollment week is only open to people who are on the wait list and they're the only people who will get notification of that. So if any of this strikes your fancy, if you want to learn how to implement what I taught you here, perhaps minus H. pylori. I do talk about natural treatment of H. pylori in Banish the Burn, which is a um, like an add-on to the FODMAP Freedom Suite, but it's not part of the core curriculum. Um, and I don't really talk about a ton of the sexy topics outside of what I've rattled off here. Um, you know, I'm not going to teach you about like Lyme disease or mold or anything like that in FODMAP Freedom. But if you want to learn how to implement what I've just taught you and make it make sense for you as an individual and make it something that you can hopefully do for the rest of your life and maintain your health for the rest of your life, I would love to start my new year with you. I hope that you will consider joining us. And again, I hope that you'll join the waitlist so that you can make sure that you get your seat.